right, so hello everybody and another uh, great day here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My name is Jesse and I'm your virtual adventure guide for today's program. Now yesterday we got the chance to hang out with Heidi Carlisle. She is the Education and Outreach Director at the Lucky Peak Research Station, part of the Intermountain Bird Observatory of Boise State University. So if you get in your 4x4 and you drive up the mountain before the snow sets in for the season, you get the chance to hang out with some amazing scientists working to understand, chart, uh, and, and sort of assess the bird populations and individual bird health up on the mountain in such a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. So every year we get the chance to hang out with Heidi and learn a little bit about all the amazing migrating species that are passing through the area. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Heidi to share with us a little bit about what they're catching by way of songbirds, how many, what kind, what they're looking for, and more, and then we'll dive in with all of your questions. So Heidi, thank you so much for joining us again today. And um, yeah. the podcast. <laughs> Thanks, happy to be back. Uh, so like Jesse said, I'm up here at our Lucky Peak Research Station. Um, it's a remote field station just outside of Boise, Idaho in the Western United States. And today we're here studying songbird migration. So songbirds are passing through, most of them coming from farther north from us in Alaska and Canada. They're passing through our station and they might winter here in Idaho or they might be headed even farther south. So we have a few birds at the station, so I think I might just jump straight in and turn my camera around so that you guys can see a bit of the action and I can kind of tell you what our scientists are working on, if that works for you guys. Works for me. While you're doing that and changing the camera around, I'll just note again, uh, if people want to learn more about the Intermountain Bird Observatory, all the cool stuff you're doing up there, your website is on the screen now, and you can check them out on all social media platforms, including these on Twitter and Instagram below. Some really, really cool pictures of what Heidi and her team are doing. But let's head to the yurt together and find out what's going on at the station. Okay, so we have our team of scientists here this morning. They are banding and tagging some little birds. Rebecca here has a sparrow little white crowned sparrow and Lucian here has a ruby crowned kinglet. So you can see Rebecca is actually weighing this bird. She's getting ready to let it go. One of the last things we do is weigh them just in case they get away, but you can see we put them in that little tube temporarily just to hold them long enough to weigh them <laughs> and then we let them go. <laughs> and uh, Lucian here, I think just put the band on his bird. So his little ruby crown kinglet, oh, he's actually about to put the band on. So I'll let you guys watch up close. He's opening the band with those little pliers. And that makes it a nice little C shape so that it can slip around this bird's leg. And then the pliers have a hole in them that lets him close the band around the leg and squeeze that band nice and tight so that it gets a good seal without actually touching the leg of the bird. So he can tighten that band, make sure it fits nicely like a watch or a bracelet. It can spin and move up and down, um, and it has no sharp edges or anything to catch on that bird's leg, which is important because this little kinglet is gonna be wearing that band for the rest of their life. So we wanna make sure it fits nicely. That band has a nine digit number on it that's unique to that bird. So it's like a social security number or a phone number. No other bird in the world will have that number or at least no other bird in North America. So these bands are coordinated by the Bird Banding Lab, which coordinates within North America, so Canada, the United States, and migrating birds in Mexico. So we're all connected, all the biologists across the continent, uh, to make sure that we're sharing the same data with each other. So Lucian is measuring this bird and writing down its wing length and its tail length. And here's Rebecca, she's putting on another band on another ruby crown kinglet. So we, this time of year are getting a lot of ruby crown kinglets. There are species that can overwinter down into Mexico, California, um, but some of them overwinter here in Idaho. So it'll be interesting to see on their birds. We often see different fat levels depending on where that bird is planning to go. So if they're about done with migration, they might not be carrying much fat. They don't need that extra energy from that fat. They're not planning on flying much further. Um, and if they're planning on continuing and going really far, we'll see lots and lots of fat. So that fat is their kind of their gas in their gas tank. So they're full of fuel ready to go on a long journey. So you can see these two scientists are blowing on these birds to spread their feathers out of the way. And they're actually trying to look at the skin underneath and see through that skin to their fat and muscle. So 
many birds and especially songbirds have skin that's so thin that you can actually see right through it. So they'll be looking for the purplish color of that bird's muscle and then the orangish color if it has any fat. Um, and we'll see, are either of your guys' birds fat? Okay, so we can try to show you guys the fat. Sometimes it works with my camera, sometimes not, but it's fun to get to see. They often have little blobs of fat, little pot bellies, and sometimes little uh, bulges on their sides if they're super fat. So we'll get to take a look at that. Uh, so along with kind of figuring out whether they're migrating or staying, fat gives us an idea of how good the habitat is. So a bird needs to eat to get fat. And so you might imagine if there's lots of food around here on the mountainside, birds would be able to get fat really quickly. If there's not a lot of food for those birds, then they're not going to be able to fatten as, as um, fast. So we're looking at the birds we're catching, and then we're also looking at our recaptures to see if they're gaining weight quickly while they're here. Okay, let's see if we can try to see some fat on Lucian's bird. There, you can see that little orange color. You can see the nice reddish purple chest muscle. And let's see if there's a little pot belly. Yeah, there's a little orange pot belly. Nice. Cool. Thanks, Lucian. Is that bird ready to fly? Yep. Can I get a video of it flying away? All right. So once we're done, you can see Lucian process that bird really quickly. Once we're done, we let him fly off. And they'll head off back into this beautiful habitat at Lucky Peak. Usually. <laughs> there we go, buddy. <laughs> cool. All right. So I can take you guys back to the yurt and we'll see what else we're banding. Looks like more kinglets and more kinglets. Ta -da! <laughs> so along with identifying their species and looking at their fat levels and muscle levels, we're also looking at their age and their sex. So one interesting thing we're seeing right now, today, is we're catching more female kinglets than males. And we tend to see that early in migration. And as migration continues, we'll start seeing the males come through. So females come through first. They often go farther south. They are going to overwinter in much warmer places. The males come through later. They might stay farther north because they want to be as close as possible to their nesting grounds. Uh, they want to beat everybody else back in that race of spring migration in the um, early next year. So that's a really good clue to us that migration is not close to being done yet, which is good because we haven't seen that many kinglets yet this year. So we're really hoping to see more of them move through um, as the season goes along. So let's see. I can show you guys our data sheet and show you a few more birds since we have them. Um, but you can see all this data, ooh, bulging with fat. Okay, we'll try to get that on video. All this data, each line is a bird that we've processed. We band usually between five and 7,000 songbirds every season. And this year we're sitting at right about 3,000 that we've banded so far. We'll keep banding until the middle of October. So we still have a couple weeks left of our season. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> so we're also checking to see if they're growing any feathers that can give us a clue to their age. Oh, sure. Let's look at it. So Alexis here. Oh, yeah. Has a little tail feather that's just growing in. That means this bird accidentally lost it. Right there, that little pin. This bird accidentally lost its tail feather somehow. And you can kind of imagine that little pin is like a flower bud and it's gonna bloom and that little feather is gonna grow out of that pin there. Um, so maybe chased by a predator, a lot of songbirds have the ability to drop tail feathers, kind of like you hear about lizards and skinks dropping their tail to dis distract a predator. Uh, songbirds can do the same thing. They'll drop those feathers and then grow them back in. So, Oh, yeah, I was going to also say, so we were looking at the age of these birds, too. So um, you'll see our scientists spreading the birds' wings. And what they're doing is they're looking at the condition of the feathers. And it's sort of like human teeth. So when these baby birds are first hatched, they don't have much for feathers, just like when we're first born, we don't have any teeth usually. Then as we get older, we grow our baby teeth. And then as we get even older we grow our adult teeth and we kind of lose them and grow them in a set pattern, right? So 
If you've lost any teeth, I bet for most of you, it was your, some of your front teeth fell out first. And then as you get older, maybe you'll grow in your molars. And so birds follow a set pattern like that too, where they lose some of the feathers on their wing and replace them their first year. And then when they're adults, then they have all adult feathers. So we can get a good idea of the bird's age by looking at those feathers on the wing. 7.1, so that is a fat bird. <laughs> nice. So seven, yeah, let's try to see it if you don't mind. Oh yeah, holy moly, look at that fat. So you guys can see all that orange fat. And fat little belly, woohoo! So this bird's skinny should weigh about five and a half grams, so about five and a half Skittles. Um, or five and a half paper clips, but this bird has a ton of fat, so it weighed about seven grams. So that gives us a really good idea that this bird is full of fuel, ready to migrate, and is probably heading quite far south from us. I, I do love the weight linkage to Skittles. Thank you very much for that, Heidi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, no problem. Fat, little belly, fat little belly isn't a phrase we get very often in our program, so I'm glad we got <laughs> like that. This is like the most releases we've ever had in one of these sessions. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. They're busy this morning with songbirds. So uh, today is supposed to be really hot, and then tomorrow is supposed to be really cold. So I suspect these birds are sensing the barometric pressure and knowing, oh, boy, the weather is about to change. I need to get fat and get out of here. Um, so I bet we'll see a lot of fat birds today. So how long are you guys actually catching these birds? Like how long is the season? When do you begin this process? So we start in mid-July, which is, you know, before school starts for most people. And it's usually what people think of as summertime. But already in mid-July, we have some birds that are heading south for the winter. They know winter's coming. They have a long journey ahead of them. Maybe they're eating insects. So they want to make sure that they um, are leaving when the weather is warm so that they have a lot of food to eat along the way. Um, and then we continue until middle of October, and we could go a little bit longer. There still are some migrating birds coming through, but this station, believe it or not, gets, you know, more than a meter of snow, so more than four or five feet of snow um, in the winter. So we can't really be up here. Uh, we wouldn't be able to get up or down the road in the wintertime. So we have to leave middle of October just to make sure our team isn't stuck up here for the whole winter time. Well, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to hang out with you before you go. And I wanted to stress, yesterday we were talking about uh, new snow there versus where I am in Newfoundland. We get 13 feet, I'm just saying, uh, compared to you guys in Idaho. So I don't know. <laughs> there you oh. go. <laughs> um, if it's our okay, excuse is we don't have a snow plow. To, uh, we don't have a snow plow that can get on our dirt road. <laughs> there are so many willing graduate students who can shovel for you all the way up the mountain, though. We'll talk about that later. We'll yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Heidi, if you're good with it, I can dive in with our classes and take some questions from them. And then if anything else happens at the station that you really want to show us, we can pause and take a break for that. Does that sound good? That sounds perfect. Rebecca's working on the last bird and then they're out doing a net check. So we'll see if they bring back anything besides kinglets. That's exciting. Um, and I can turn my camera around. Oh, feel free to, wherever you want, the camera is totally fine. We can see what's going on as we chat, but uh, we'll head to Ms. Fisher. Right, cool. Grade twos in Port Sanilac in Michigan. Welcome in Ms. Fisher's class. You guys want just to watch your Rebecca. Uh, you can ask a question for us. Here we go. Hi. Hi. Ivan has a question. Why do um, birds have a lot of feathers? Yeah. Why do they have a lot of feathers? That's a good question. So you guys saw how thin their skin is, right? So it's see-through. We can actually, these birds have fat covering their intestines, but we can actually see through birds' skin and see their intestines. We can see their bones. So that skin is not very good at protecting their bodies from the elements. We humans have pretty thick skin, so that protects us from getting scratched. It protects us from the sun and the wind. Um, but birds need feathers to do that. So they have hundreds and thousands of feathers all over their body to protect their bodies from the elements. And then, of course, if we had feathers, maybe we could fly. So those feathers on their wings and their tail are what allow birds to fly. Um, they're a really good adaptation because they're very lightweight. So you can imagine if you're working hard to stay in the air, the lighter, the better. Um, so feathers are a really great way for birds to accomplish that. Here's this little kinglet getting weighed. 
So I was going to ask about this, actually, because we got to see that really, really well. And great question, uh, Ivan. But why are you weighing them upside down in a tube? And how do they feel about that? <laughs> so we weigh them upside down in a tube because they've probably never been upside down in their life before. So it's a good way to weigh them without them realizing that they are free, that we're not holding them. Uh, you know, we tried asking them to just stand nicely on the scale, uh, but that didn't work too well. So we stick them upside down. They probably are a little bit confused and wondering what is going on in this dark place. Um, but we do it really quickly and then we take them back out. Uh, for birds like woodpeckers or nuthatches that live in nest cavities, they go in holes all the time. Yeah. A lot of times we have to be really careful because those guys know exactly how to get out of those holes. So they'll just back right out. Uh, we have to keep a close eye on them. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Heidi. All right, Ethan and Liam joining us in Indiana. If you guys want to unmute your mic and ask a question, you are good to go. Hi, boys. Oh, we got oh, There you go. Yeah, you're good to go. Um, What happens if the birds don't uh, fly away after you release them? Oh, what happens if they don't fly away when we release them? Well, you might have seen Lucian uh, on that little kinglet that was sitting on his hand. He gave it a little tap on the tail feathers. Sometimes we'll give them a poof of air on their bottom, and that usually wakes them up and says, oh, hey, wait a minute, I'm free. Um, so we have a few tricks up our sleeve to get them to fly away uh, if they're not quite ready at first. So Rebecca, and we can keep taking questions, but just to tell you guys what she's working on, she is pulling out a new string of bands. So there are bands come in wire strings of 100, and we keep them in little film canisters, these little tubes, um, so that we can keep them in order and also so we don't lose them. They're very tiny and we don't want to drop them. And so you'll be able to see Rebecca loading this uh, into the tube while you guys are asking more questions. Oh. Sorry, trying to get back into the stream there. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Hi, uh, folks on YouTube, if you do have any questions there as well, please feel free to share in the chat. We'll take as many as we can. Uh, but while we're prepping this bird uh, and all this cool stuff going on, I'm going to head to Miss Fisher's class again. You guys have another one for us? Come on in. Hey. All right. So Tessa was wondering. Do certain Why does certain birds travel? At certain times. Yes. Oh, very good question. So why do certain birds travel at certain times? So the pattern we see at our station is their timing kind of depends on where they're headed. So if they have a really long journey and they're heading really far south to places like South America, Central America, Southern Mexico, they leave early, right? So they want to make sure they leave with plenty of time on their hands to get down to where they're going before the weather gets cold. Um, birds that maybe are just going to stay right here in Idaho for the winter, they come through later. They don't have very far to go, so they can take their time. They can enjoy the nice weather up here before they start heading south. So we see big differences in timing based on what species of bird. Um, and to get into it a little, in a little bit more detail than that, we tend to see birds that can eat seeds, stay here for the winter because there's plenty of seeds around. Birds that eat insects, and especially ones that eat insects like caterpillars um, or aphids that are not definitely not here in Idaho in the winter, those are the species that have to leave because their food is totally gone. So if they stayed, they would go, they would go hungry pretty quickly. So we see a big difference based on what they eat. Yeah, great question, guys. Uh, you talked about bands on the bird's legs earlier, and we didn't get this question yesterday, so I wanted to highlight. So what happens if the bird keeps growing? Like, the, is the band, does it grow with it? Does it fall off? What's the deal if uh, the leg gets bigger? Uh, good question. So we're lucky with songbirds that once they leave the nest, their legs and their whole bodies are pretty much full grown. So we actually know, based on the species, what band size that bird is going to take. And we know based on other research that that leg is not going to get any bigger. So we can safely put a band on that leg and know that they're never going to outgrow that band. Um, so, for example, every single ruby crown kinglet wears a size 0A band, um, which is the smallest band we have. So they're pretty tiny little guys. Okay. So you have different, like you have a whole array of bands for different birds that you might be able to capture? Or? Oh, yeah. And I can show you guys that, actually. So I can show you all the different band sizes. Um, we keep them in a tackle box. You guys can see all our lovely field equipment in our yurt here. 
but we have all our different band sizes and they're each in a different container here. Um, so we know which one to grab and they're all labeled here. So we have zero A, zero, and these bands for most of our songbirds go all the way up to one A. But we also have bigger bands for things like woodpeckers or robins or hawks. So this is one of our bigger bands that we use. Um, and then of course, for really big hawks and raptors, I can show you guys this. So this is a leg gauge that we can use to measure if we're not sure what band size to put on. Huh. And so you can see all the way down here is our zero A band. And the biggest bands we put on are nine bands. Those are for golden eagles. So you can see a golden eagle leg is much, much bigger than my thumb. Yeah. I, I don't know if our students have ever seen a golden eagle in person or even in pictures, but they're one of the most incredible birds in the world. I was going to ask what the biggest one there was for, so thank you for feeding me to it. Yeah, there um, you go. Let's head back to Indiana. Ethan, Liam, if you guys have another one, unmute your mic, and uh, you're good to go. Hey, guys. Nope, no questions. That's okay. Let me know in the chat if you do have any <laughs> others. Um, Ms. Fisher's class, do you guys have any more? We'll go for a couple more minutes uh, before we wrap up. But Michigan, if you have another question for us, come on in. Yep, Ava's got a question. Hi, Ava. How do you catch the bird? Yes. Ooh, very good question. So normally I would take you and show you, but I tried it yesterday and we lost reception. Um, so we have 10 nets set up in the shrubs here. So you guys can see, and I didn't mention this yet, but Lucky Peak has this mix of conifer habitat. So nice, big, really tall Douglas fir trees over my head. And then we have these nice deciduous shrubs. So we have some bitter cherry and choke cherry. We have some nice nine bark. And we put the bird nets in these cherry shrubs because a lot of birds spend time there foraging. So finding things to eat. There are a lot of insects that live on those cherry shrubs. And then also the cherries themselves are a really good uh, food source for a lot of our migrating songbirds. They love those sugars and carbs that help them get nice and fat. And so we put these nets in between the shrubs and in places where we think the birds will fly back and forth. They run into those nets and the net forms a little hammock. So that little hammock catches the bird and holds onto it. So the bird is like in a little pocket until we're able to come by um, and take that bird out of the net. So it takes a lot of training for our scientists to be able to figure out how that bird went into the net and be able to safely pull it backwards out of the net um, when they approach and see a little songbird in there. So. so with the net making a pocket, do you ever have multiple birds at once in the same net? Or once one bird's in a net, does it sort of collapse the net where it's one at a time? It's a really big net, so it's 12 meters long or about 12 yards long. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, we can have, you know, 20 or even 30 songbirds in a net at one time. Um, yeah. We check the nets pretty often, so we don't usually have that many birds get caught at once. Um, but sometimes during peak migration, we really do see a ton of songbirds all at one time. Fantastic. Um, Ethan, Liam, if you guys have another question, let me know in the chat or you can just put your hand up. Uh, I'll come to you guys in a sec. But for now, we'll go to Michigan one more time, and uh, we'll wrap up from there. Come on in, Miss Fisher's class. Hmm. Uh, we had one more. Um, we had one more question. It was. Um, it came from the nets. Um, yeah. So you're talking about catching lots of birds in a day, and but like, do the nets stay up overnight? Would that be problematic for the the birds when you're not there to retrieve them? Yeah. Very good question. So yeah, we net every day for five hours, and then we roll the nets closed. Um, so we seal them all up and we clip them shut with clothespins um, so that nothing can get caught during the day. At this station, though, we actually do owl migration banding, too. So we close those songbird nets in the morning, but then when sunset arrives, we go back out and we open a set of nets um, to catch migrating owls. So this is one of the only stations, migration stations, where you can come up here 24-7 and there's some scientists doing some kind of work up here, which is pretty cool. Um, and that reminds me, so all these tents on the hillside are our cruise tents. We have about 12 people living up here for these three months. No water, no electricity, no shower, um, but lots of cool birds and nice scenery. So kind of a cool place to live. 
This is always the fun with, with explorers and conservationists is that the conditions can be a little suspect, but you end up with good, <laughs> really, really cool things. I must say, personally, my dream has always been to it, be it an owl banding. Just the owls in general are my favorite birds. I've seen one in the wild in my entire life. So that's where I'd be coming up is for those sunset moments. Uh -huh. Very fun. Um, Heidi, is there any last message you want to share with us about the work that you guys are doing up there or anything that our kids can do to keep the learning going when they're done? Well, so I just heard that we have a Townsend's warbler, which is a really pretty bird coming back from the nets. Ooh, so right. maybe we stick around because they're pretty beautiful. Um, yeah. But yeah, so as far as conservation and birds, so I think we had this question yesterday. We do a lot of bird banding research where we're collecting data from birds in that way. But as scientists, we really need everybody's help to help us collect information and data. And it's really important for conservation. So one thing I always like to plug is that you can actually be a scientist too. So you can collect data on birds using eBird, or you can collect data on uh, birds, but also insects, plants, mammals, anything you see uh, using an app called iNaturalist. So you can submit your sightings and real scientists, professional scientists actually use that information all the time. Um, to help them make conservation decisions. So really important and something you guys can do um, to help out us as scientists. And um, I love when we, we highlight this because when we were growing up, Heidi, like there's nothing like this. You, you could never yeah. you know, a scientist. You had to go to a university. You had to talk to a scientist. You might happen to want to have you help them. But iNaturalist and eBird are just the most incredible tools for any class that are interested. Um, I also like to highlight Zooniverse, which is sort of a... a oh, yeah glomatory of like uh, 50 different projects that people can take part in on all sorts of topics around the world. Is this our Tennyson's Warbler? This is another Ruby Crown Kinglet, but I figured I might as well show you guys while we're waiting for the Townsends. <laughs> um, so Ruby Crown Kinglets breed in conifer forests, so like evergreen forests. Um, and Townsend's Warblers do too, but they really like wet uh, kind of rainforest forests. So things with hemlocks and cedars. Um, and so Townsend's warblers are a cool one that come from the north of us. They don't actually breed here. So whenever we get to see them um, is a special treat. And they're beautiful kind of yellow and black birds. So we'll see. I don't know. Did you have, have you heard, Rebecca, when it's coming back or who's bringing it? Seven minutes. OK, well, we'll see if we can hang out that long. But uh, if not, maybe I can post a picture for you guys. I can bring up one, two on, online, so let's find this together. Oh, yeah, cool. Oh, let's see. Townsend's Warbler. Um, I'm sure, we're, we're getting the whole team to try and figure out if we have this bird close by, which is very exciting. Um, <laughs> Heidi, what is the – you talk about a bird that's sort of unusual coming there. What is the rarest bird you guys have? Oh, yeah. This season, our rarest bird was a bird called, called an oven bird. So it's a warbler that comes from the East Coast. And we don't hardly ever see them in Idaho. And it was actually the very first oven bird we had ever captured at our station. So pretty cool. Oh, yeah. There's nice Townsend's Warbler photos. Yes, we got all sorts of Townsend's Warbler pictures there. So really beautiful, charismatic, cute little bird. Wow. Yeah. Oh, lucky you guys. Well, <laughs> We might wrap up for our class's sake uh, in advance if we don't know quite when he's going to come. But I, I, if you do get a picture, by all means, share it with us after the fact. And we got a Raptor team coming in just about an hour and a bit, uh, too. So you can hang out with Joe and show our classes there. Um, but Heidi, I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, nice to see all the stuff you guys got going up on Lucky Week. Yeah. Here, I'll uh, switch back so you guys can see my face. But yeah, Perfect. thanks for having me on. And uh, glad we caught some birds for you guys. Yeah, well, we'll say farewell with Ethan and Liam, Miss Fisher's class. If you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye, you are all on camera. Thank you, guys. Thank you on YouTube. Thank you. Bye. Bye.